to offer a reflection on our gospel reading from Matthew 25. And it's fitting that we're reading this passage for the final Sunday of the Christian year, the Sunday of Christ the King, before we move into the Advent season in celebration of both the commemoration of Christ's incarnation and an eager expectation for his coming again. In our reading today, we see the reality of a kind of coming of Christ. We might call this his parousia, though I would like to say that the word coming, parousia in Scripture, is not tied necessarily just to his first coming or to his final coming, but it encapsulates and encompasses the reality of Christ's presence. And his presence right now at the right hand of the Father, his presence before us in the Holy Eucharist, his presence in the reading of his word, and that continues until the end of the age. In this passage in particular, though, we see Christ's presence manifested in a kind of judgment taking place, a judgment between sheep and goats. The sheep are said to be the inheritance of eternal life, and the goats are said to suffer condemnation consigned to the fires of hell. The context of this passage is intimately tied to what came just prior in Matthew 24, which is often called the Olivet Discourse. And this discourse is a very precise prophecy regarding the vindication of Christ over apostate Jerusalem and the subsequent judgment that fell upon Jerusalem in AD 70 when the Romans came and burned their city, destroying the temple and leaving not one stone upon another just as our Lord Jesus Christ had said. Christ will always be vindicated over his enemies. And the same is true for his people. He defends his people. He protects his people. He vindicates his people. When we come to Matthew 25, our passage today, we see another judgment. This time, this judgment is expanded from just a narrow focus on the land of Israel to now all the nations. The nations are gathered before the king who sits on his glorious throne. And this judgment is given to these nations on the basis of how they treat the least of these, who very specifically are referred to as the king's brothers a term never used to refer to humanity as a whole. The term brothers is always used in the New Testament of those who have a relationship to the Lord, those who do the will of the Lord. In other words, the least of these are primarily Christians who are in need. This has led some commentators to, I think, rightly assume that the primary thing in view here are the apostles, and the missionaries that are bringing the gospel into the world. That's the primary context. And if this is the primary audience in view, what we have is practically an expanded picture of what we see in the Olivet Discourse. Christ sends his brethren out, first to the Jews, and because the Jews rejected the brethren, marked not simply by a refusal to receive the gospel, but also the outright persecution of them, the Jews were judged and condemned. In like manner, just as Jesus commands, the gospel now goes out past Jerusalem to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And it is here that the nations also have a choice, either to care for the brethren of the king, receiving their gospel, becoming part of the fold, and caring for one another as Christ cares for us, or by turning their backs on the brethren, failing both to receive their gospel and to care for for their fundamental human needs. This message to the nations had first century significance, as the gospel and the brethren of the Lord did go out to the broader Roman Empire, the nations. St. Paul says in one of his letters that the gospel has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. However, this passage has also rightly and nearly universally been recognized as a reference to the final judgment at the end of the age. And this, I think, is also most definitely true, because the judgments we see here are not simply historical judgments, as we saw in Christ's earlier prophecy regarding Jerusalem. Here we see a judgment that has an eschatological implication, 
namely a judgment that ends in two realities, either heaven or hell. It is with this in mind that Christians today must take seriously this passage, not simply as a warning for those in a bygone era, but for us today, pointing towards the fact that what we do, just as what the first century nations did, has an impact on how we are to be judged when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, as we confess each week. As Christians brought into the fold of God through holy baptism, we are submitted under the kingship of Christ. We answer to him. He is our supreme monarch, the head of his church, the foundation. He watches and rules the nations with a rod of iron, and he judges them according to their works, whether good or evil. As his sheep of the nations brought into his fold, you and I have a duty to care for the least of the Lord's brethren. This is part of what things like tithing pertain to. We pour our resources into the church with regularity that the church may use those tithes and offerings to care for the brethren of the Lord. Normatively, starting first with its ministers to enable them to continue to toil for the sake of the sheep, then expanding to care for the greater needs of the congregation, and then for the broader Catholic Church, and finally for the needs of those out in the world. Tithing isn't the extent of this practice, however. This is also made manifest in the practice of things like hospitality, making meals for those in need, buying them supplies for their everyday necessities, offering to babysit, bringing the blessed Eucharist when someone is ill. These are all very practical and tangible ways in which we care for the brethren of the Lord. And what we do for these, we do unto Christ himself, as we read in verse 40 of chapter 25. So for example, Sergio and Liz, when you guys pick up Geraldine and provide a ride to service, What you do for her, you do for Christ. The Christian faith is tangible. It can be seen, it can be felt, and its impact lasts generations. It requires works of love, love for Christ that overflow into works of mercy for his body. And it is unavoidable that how we treat one another, how we serve the least of the brethren, plays a role in the way in which we are judged at the eschatological judgment seat of Christ. Notice, starting in verse 34, what the king says to the sheep. This is what he says, quote, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it, for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. End quote. The sheep are invited into the kingdom because of their works. To the goats, this is what is said in verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. End quote. The goats are separated from life, not simply because of their sinful actions, but what they had left undone. Their lack of works sends them to hell. 
Now, for many of us who grew up in a Protestant context, the clear emphasis on works as being a foundation for final judgment can be extraordinarily off-putting. Does this not destroy the foundation of justification as being by faith, as our 39 Articles of Religion say? To the contrary, I want to make a case that this final judgment by work actually establishes faith. It upholds faith. And it shows it to be rooted not in a Gnostic and empty belief, but in a lively faith, as Archbishop Thomas Cranmer taught, one that is demonstrated by its fruit. Protestant theologian Peter Lightheart, who is a dedicated proponent of justification by faith alone, says this, and I think he couldn't have said it any better or any stronger, quote, Many Protestants minimize this kind of passage, referring to Matthew 25, and they weaken it. Protestants insist that we are not saved by what we do, we are saved by what Jesus does. When we stand at the final judgment, Matthew 25 does not describe what is going to happen, many Protestants think. Jesus will not ask whether we have been generous to the needy, but whether we believe in justification by faith, we will not be judged by our righteousness, but by the imputed righteousness of Jesus. These passages, and many others, however, show that we will be judged by what we do according to our works. There is no passage in Scripture that says anything different. We are brought into the kingdom by God's grace and favor, but in the end we will be judged by our works. End quote. Now remember, this is coming from a Protestant, one who claims to uphold justification by faith alone. And I can assure you, as I have poured over this passage, and I have poured over the writings of the fathers on this passage, and even the writings of some of the Anglican divines, I have come away with the same answer. There are no passages of Scripture that teach a judgment apart from works. None. It does not exist. So this might cause us to ask the question, can a subject claim submission to a king by lip service only? Or will his life necessarily manifest the truthfulness of his claim to submit to the king? Of course, the latter is true. Somewhere along the way, I feel as though many of us have lost a complete view of the human person. We are not simply souls divorced from our bodies and the actions that they do. Thus, if we're going to avoid the heresy of docetism, we cannot say that what is true of our souls is not also true of our bodies. We cannot say that we are perfect in spirit and yet somehow sinful in our bodies. Our liturgy actually explicitly denies this. L listen to the prayer of humble access and pay attention to the words that we say every single Sunday. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of the dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink His blood, listen, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by His body and our souls washed by His most precious blood. What we pray is an explicit affirmation that what is true of our body must likewise be true of our soul. This means that what we do in the body is a reflection of our spiritual state because we cannot separate the soul from the body. So either our actions are inclined towards Christ, or they are moving away. Thus, if we say we have faith and yet do not have works, as St. James says so clearly, our faith is dead. This passage, brothers and sisters, is a sobering reminder of our duty towards one another in Christ. And what is at stake if we turn from the grace of God that enables the good works that we were created in Christ Jesus to do? The nations are the object of Christ's great commission to his apostles. And the nations will be judged based on how they received the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And so us, having come from the nations into the fold of the sheep, we must ask ourselves this question. Do we love the church? Do we care for her needs? Do we live in such a way that what belongs to us belongs to our brethren? Do we, like the church in Acts, hold all things in common, ready and willing to lay down our lives for our fellow brethren? 
These are all the kind of questions that we must ask as we seek deeper fellowship with one another in Christ Jesus. For in living these works of love wrought in us by the Spirit of God, we not only experience deeper fellowship and union with one another, but we experience deeper fellowship and union with Jesus Christ himself. That is the object of our faith, is fellowship and union with Christ. And we experience that and grow in that through our union with one another. No one intentionally forsakes the care of his or her own body. How much more so should we care for the body of Christ, the very temple of the living God? Christ the King reigns on high, and even now he judges among the nations. Even now those nations who have become the persecutors of the church are falling under the judgment of the Lord, just as Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70. Even now Christ comes to his churches and the holy sacrifice of the Mass to see their works, whether it is good or evil. Even now he calls us to repent and to continually turn from our own wickedness into the works that he has prepared for us to walk in. So may we, in keeping with our confession of faith, never grow weary of loving and serving one another, so that on the day when we stand before the throne of the King, on that consummate eschatological day, we might hear the words, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And as a comfort as I close out this homily, notice the word that Jesus uses. He doesn't say, come you who have merited the kingdom. He says, come inherit the kingdom. To inherit something means that it is a gift given to true sons, not something earned, not something merited. So even in this, this necessity for works, it is not something we merit or strive to do apart from the favor and grace of God that enables us as his sons to do it. So even here, while we process and think about this sobering reality, it should stir in our hearts a sense of awe that when we walk in the way of righteousness and truth, when we do what is good, when we care for one another, it is only because it is Christ who is working within us by His grace. So let us be careful to look for Him in the others we interact with. May we do unto them as we would do unto Christ himself. That we might be worthy of the title brother, the title of son. And may we stand before his throne blameless, praising him for all the glory and honor that he possesses as our Lord and as our King. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.